Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to LPTV. My name is Dan Fishman. I am the executive director of the Libertarian Party. And today we're having a town hall about government overreach. It's something the Libertarians have talked about a lot, and it's in everybody's mind right now. With the tragic death, murder of a man in Minneapolis, the explosion of protests across the country, we're looking at people being more aware than ever of the role that government has played in our lives and how government has expanded that role, especially in law enforcement, to the point that a lot of people now are thinking about the fact that maybe we don't need a government this big. Maybe we don't need a police force that's this powerful. One of the things that's always been true is that we have granted to law enforcement in the United States the ability to, in a moment, be judge, jury, and executioner. And sadly, that happened in Minneapolis, and Americans are responding. My first guest tonight is a man who needs no introduction, but that's not going to stop me from doing it anyway. Larry Sharp, in addition to having been a vice presidential candidate in 2016 and 2020 for the Libertarian Party, is one of the most influential voices in bringing the Libertarian message to the general populace. Larry has an ability to distill an issue down to what matters to people, or as he says, hit them in the feels. Larry's a guy who I have looked up to in terms of messaging for a long time, but he also is somebody who has an important voice in this particular issue. And so, without further ado, let me introduce my friend, Larry Sharp. Larry, how's it going? Hey guys, how are you? Pretty good, thank you so much for being here. You are uh, a guest on a lot of shows right now, uh, you know, the sharp way you're covering a lot of the important issues that are out here. I appreciate you making time for us. For people who don't know you, how would you like to be introduced to them? Um, Larry Sharp, libertarian, um, business uh, consultant, and video podcaster with the sharp way. That's what I am. That's outstanding. You're also, you know, as, as a prominent libertarian, uh, you're also a New Yorker. That's true. I live in New York City. AOC is my congressperson. Interesting. Does she yes. consult you on a lot of stuff? <laughs> uh, she consults when exactly nothing. Oh, well, that's, yes. that's not what I'm surprised about. Yes. Um, but so in addition to New Yorker now, let's let's talk about a couple other things that I want to talk about briefly in your background. You are, I guess we don't say former Marine, right? You're, you're, you are a Marine. You are an active. See the picture? Yep. <laughs> where, where, where did you do your basic? Uh, of course, uh, Paris Island. That's where real Marines go. Okay, fair Come enough. On. And we don't right. call it basic. It's boot camp. Basic is for these army guys. See, this is this is this is good. This is exposing me as having <laughs> not been a Marine. Um, and now, uh, in addition to that, you grew up with a, a law enforcement officer in your life. I did. I I've seen both sides of the war on drugs, and I've seen both sides of the war on poverty in in, in all of those cases. My father. Uh, originally was a uh, a transit cop. Uh, for those who don't know, subway and non-subway are two separate um, police forces. So, and then became a uh, a cop for I'm sorry, then became a corrections officer at Rikers Island. And this right now, Rikers Island is the most violent jail in the country. And my mother um, actually was a uh, an addict and was a convicted felon. She was a victim of the drug war. Wow. So when we talk about some of these issues tonight, you have you have really seen it all. So let me ask you a first question, sort of based on what happened uh, and George Floyd in Minneapolis. Uh, you're an African-American living in New York, which had really one of the worst overreaches in a long time in stop and frisk. Yep. Did you know people who were affected by it? Were you ever affected by it? I personally wasn't. No, I, I personally wasn't. Um, stop and frisk also went by how you looked, right? And when I work in Manhattan, I tend to work in areas that were banker areas. Most of my business is either in tech, law, finance, and I'm always wearing a suit and jacket, right? A jacket and, 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 and so I'm not wearing a hoodie, if that makes any right. sense, right? When I'm out there hanging around Manhattan. So it, it didn't affect me at all in that regard. It affected people in certain areas and affected people who looked a certain way. And that's why uh, people got so upset about that. Absolutely, but don't forget, we also had a black man choked to death. We had Eric, Eric Garner. Yep, Eric Garner, who was, uh, for those who don't know the story, he was selling loose cigarettes. Uh, yeah, correct. In the vernacular. Uh, but these were cigarettes that he had actually purchased. In fact, uh, we talked about this on the Libertarian Party Facebook page today. He was selling something 
that he could have been giving away for free. Correct. And I'm, I'm a former smoker. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell people that I probably have bummed thousands of cigarettes in my lifetime. Probably every time you tried quitting. Exactly. Exactly. Because yeah, I remember I tell my friends would tell me, "Well, you, I'm quitting." I said, "You didn't. You didn't stop quitting. You stopped buying." <laughs> you <better. laughs> so you That's stopped exactly doing. what it is. And, and so, and so, nobody's arguing either that if somebody had come up to him and said, "Hey, man, can I bum a cigarette?" and he gave it to him, that would have been perfectly legal. Correct. On the other hand, if he had said to them, "Yeah, you know, I, I give you a cigarette," and they said, "How about if I give you twenty five cents just to make up for it?" and he said, "No, no, no, oh, here, let me give you a quarter." Suddenly, that becomes illegal. Yeah. Right. That's the sort of thing about it. And that leads to sort of the beginning of our issue. There's a lot of laws in our books that make criminals out of people who are engaged in relatively normal behaviors. Well, the, the issue I will always say is that it's the system itself. Right. And the story I tell often is people think, well, it's because of, of, of white racist cops. It isn't um, black cops, Hispanic cops, Asian cops also kill and hurt brown and black people. Right. It isn't just the white thing. Right. I, I want to make sure people are clear. The system itself is the issue. What I mean by that, my father, as I said, was initially was a cop and then moved over to corrections. He had some friends who were still in the police force. And one of those uh, friends was an undercover New York City cop. And he was undercover for many years. And when he came out from being undercover for many years, he was totally jaded. And I was walking with him one day in the Bronx, probably I was seven or eight years old. I don't remember, I was an elementary school kid. And he's pointing at people while he's holding my hand and walk with me saying, yeah, that guy... He's going to do this thing. Oh, her, she's that. He was assigning crimes to people that they hadn't done anything, that he didn't even know who they were. He'd become so jaded that he believed these people were bad. This is what our system has done. The war on drugs, you combine that with civil asset forfeiture. What that winds up happening is now you have an incentive for police forces to hunt, to basically get enough money to, to survive, right? So where are you going to hunt? You're not going to hunt in, uh, in, a, in a wealthy community. Those people vote. Then that can affect your sheriff or your mayor. Those people give money to politicians. Again, can affect your sheriff or your, your sheriff or your county executive or your mayor. And those people have lawyers. And they might sue you and they might win. So you don't hunt there. But more importantly, there's no cash there. There's no cash because those people all use credit cards or checks. They don't owe, owe their phones. There's no cash there. So where is their cash? There's cash where there's e illegal activity because you can't use banks. So tons of cash in poor neighborhoods, tons of cash in immigrant neighborhoods where people come and don't trust banks from where they were. So they keep everything in cash. Cash with people who are working poor, who don't have bank accounts, who just cash their check every single week at a check cashing joint. There's cash there. So you begin hunting there. Well, if you hunt in brown and black communities for the past seven, eight, ten years, you start thinking everybody who's brown or black, they're bad. Of course, of course, not thinking that. That's normal. The system itself encourages people to act in a racist manner, whether they're actually racist or not. So now when you have Eric Garner, who's just selling cigarettes, the assumption is the last guy you saw selling something was a bad guy. So, so is Eric Garner. So let's get him and he might have a gun or a knife or whatever. So let's punish him. And this is what we happen. The system creates, the system encourages racism. And those people who are racist get to become monsters and those people who aren't racist wind up being just apathetic. That's what you see constantly. It's an interesting thing too, that the police uh, who are viewed as the most successful are the ones who actually make the most busts, the one who make the Correct. most arrests when by any normal standards, it would be the, what the police forces that have the least amount of crime in their area that we should be applauding and saying, those are the ones who are the most successful. Well, but yes. In today's world, we've made a we've made a, a big error, right? I understand that government wants to measure things. I get that. I can't stand it, but I can understand it because you want to validate your taxation, you want to validate your your horrible policies. So you want to have some way of measuring and say, "See, this is why I'm crushing you because of this reason." So you want to validate. It. I get that. But how about in today's world, instead of validating it by the old way, which is how many arrests you make? Because the problem is if it's always about arrests, right? So now I keep arresting people. And eventually people say, okay, either don't do this thing or find a way around this thing so I don't get arrested. Well, now cops can't arrest you. What must they do? Create more laws so they can keep arresting you. Change the law so they can arrest you. Right. Get, get, get around that get around you made so they can arrest you. So doing that simply mean, ensures that we're always having criminals. 
But if instead you were to do something very simple, I'm not making this up. I mean, it seriously, like a Yelp for the neighborhood, right? Are the people happy? Do they feel that the cops are, are, are safe and they're good? Do they believe they're in a safe neighborhood? And if you are now, if the community goes, I'm good. My neighborhood is safe. I'm happy with what the police are doing. Cops get a, a yay. Whether they arrest one person or 14,000 is irrelevant. The, the, the piece is, are the people happy? But it's the second piece. With civil asset forfeiture, if you don't confiscate, then you don't, you can't keep your job because that's how you fund it. So you have to keep arresting people and stealing stuff, which means you do things like literally you walk up to somebody in a car and go, do you have any cash in the car? And if the person goes, yeah, how much? $4,000. Can I see it? <laughs> yes. And they take it. Why? Yeah. They have to. They don't have a job. We've set up a situation to where they have to become pirates. They have to become yeah. bandits and high women. We've created that. But if we it's didn't have that, then they wouldn't do that. The system does that, and so does the DA. Yeah, one of my, my favorite stories about that are the guys who were traveling back, driving back to New York uh, from having won a poker tournament in Reno. Yep. And uh, they had $100,000 in cash in the car. And uh, they got stopped in Nebraska or Kansas. Uh, not sure that it, it matters which state they were stopped in, but the police officer asked them, do you have any cash in the car? And... and they said, sure, we have $100,000 in the car. And of course, they uh, confiscated it. Yep. And they had to sue to get it back. Uh, and the cash was kept in the evidence room. And when it was time to get it back, there was only $83,000 there. Yep. So that sort of thing is unfortunately way too common, which leads to an interesting question. If we could have a police, if we could have a system of like rating that you talk about where you know people say, how safe their neighborhoods are. That doesn't work in the police department's favor, really, because if they're safe, there might be less police officers, right? You could say, oh, you know, we could do more, spend more on teaching here because we have a safe community, stuff like that. So is there, you know, uh, sort of a reverse broken windows fallacy that to some extent, the police have an incentive for there to be some crime? Yeah, well, it's the same situation I brought up with corrections officers, right? When I was running in New York State, and I was talking about, you know, stopping with all of the arrests, all of the, you know, legalizing cannabis, regulating like onions, you had a lot of corrections officers go, but wait a minute, are we not going to have a job? And when I said, of course you will, we will shift and adjust. There are a bunch of people in corrections who their job is to, to be the hardcore guy to keep people in line. Right. And that's necessary for lots of people who are in prison. There's bad people in prison. Yep. And there's also a, a place for correction officers to be part of a, a way of getting people out of prison. The psychology side, the counseling side. And right now what we do in New York State and in most states is we hire out. We actually pay consultants to come in, people who don't know the prisoners, people who don't know the, the inmates, people who don't understand the culture. But instead, we simply shift the people who want to. And there are a lot of corrections officers who would happily take that role and then shift them into that. So they keep their job. They change their role. And it's voluntary. And if you ask corrections officers, this is what they say. They go, Larry, Larry I'm getting too old to be, you know, running around, run, rolling around the floor with these guys. Good. You are a candidate to become this part. And we'll keep the youngsters who want to roll around the floor with these guys. And they could do that do the, exactly the same thing with a police force. You have a police force now that instead of just arresting, could be, and they've done this in Boston, by the way. Boston has had it to where there's parts of the police force that one one of the officers in the car is completely uh, dressed up in the basically the, the, the police gear, and the other has khakis and a college shirt. That one is the talker. That's the one that when it's a domestic abuse issue can have a conversation, and when stuff gets out of hand, the, the cop who's ready can put somebody on the floor when that's required. So you shift your police force into a different type of policing. It's like firefighting. Most of the firefighters aren't spending their time putting out fires. They're doing things like teaching in schools, giving, telling people what the right answers are, helping people out. You can shift your police force into that. Maybe you don't hire as many. It might slow down hiring. That's true. And that would be a good thing. But right. some people retire anyway and leave anyway. So your police force will slowly get smaller on its own without you having to do much. You just don't hire as many. 
Right. And, and more specialized in terms of the sort of things that really has to happen. There was Absolutely. a point in time where we referred to police officers as peace officers mm -hmm. instead of law enforcement officers. And the idea of a peace officer whose person is to keep the peace, you know, go out there and keeping the peace involves a lot of, you know, facilitated discussion, stuff like that. Absolutely. That we don't see happen anymore. Now, you raised an interesting point in the last one uh, where you talked about when you were running for governor. And so that's an interesting thing because, of course, you know, we all want to know if you're running for governor again in two years. And I don't, don't need an answer for that yet. But if you had been governor during this point in time, what would your response to COVID have looked like? How would it have been different? Yeah, totally different, right? Um, the, the first thing is there were many reasons why the COVID uh, issue was a bigger issue. And I'll give you a couple of them that you would everybody would agree with. Masks, hand sanitizers, testing, um, uh, ventilators, doctors, and beds. So six issues that made it bad. All of them were made worse by government. If I was the governor, that wouldn't have happened. First thing I do as some governor, the second I see COVID move outside of China to anything else, whether that happens in, when it moves to South Korea or Singapore, wherever it goes, I go, okay, a problem. Here's the issue, Dan. Bad leaders do this. I got it. Go back to bed. I got you. That's a bad leader. And we've right. had that for a long time. It was exacerbated in 2001 when George Bush said, just go back to, we'll go bomb people. Go back to shopping. Then when the crash came, Obama said, just go back. We'll just print money. Shh, go back. And now when Trump says, just go to your house, they all did exactly the same thing. Be quiet. I got this. A good leader doesn't do that. A good leader says, I need you, Dan. Come on. Let's get going. The first thing I would have done is I would have immediately gotten rid of any distilling laws if I hadn't already got rid of them. I right. would have gotten rid of distilling laws. It's like, I don't I rescind all distilling laws, allowing immediately for now nonprofits to start do, making hand sanitizer. Then for any nonprofit, local church, American Legion, uh, Knights of Columbus, insert thing here, whatever that might be, local temple, whatever, if you want to sell hand sanitizer, no sales tax. This way you don't have to apply for it. You can start selling immediately. So what happens? People start in little communities thinking about how can I be safer? That happens right away. By the way, I was talking about this four months ago. Yeah. I was talking about this four months ago. If you start doing that, people go, oh, yeah, I'm not done with just that. Now what do I do? Is I The next thing I do is I say, guys, I need help. Can we start making masks? And then I use government for what the government is good at, which is being a central repository for information. I then take all the data that I can get, and I have the equivalent of a 911 or whatever it is, a website that says, here is what the FDA and the CDC think are the right guidelines for making a mask, and any local uh, medical associations. Also, put that on too. Here are many of them. Please, stop making masks. But again, the same thing. First thing I do is I rescind the sales tax. What does that mean? When that happens, they'll start doing designer things. They'll make Yankee masks or something. By the way, the Yankees are the greatest a team on the planet so then they'll make yankee mask or whatever the case may be just saying just saying uh so 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 that, but what would happen that begins to change the culture again the part of the hand sign i begin again getting people thinking about safety but if you look in the asian communities right now right uh in uh, new york city has chinatown koreatown they will already years ago were wearing masks in their community why they had bird flu they had sars in east asia that was part of their culture that would have been part of our culture too. It would have added that. We would have started doing it already. Boom, that begins to happen. We're thinking about it. We're beginning to understand, wait a minute, this is serious. This could hurt people, but I'm still not done. I then rescind all department of building codes that would stop someone from putting cots or beds in, again, nonprofits. Why? Local churches, VFWs, could now create places for people to sleep. Why? What if you have a multi-generational multi home? The people who are most worried about COVID-19 are the elderly, right? 43% of all the deaths came from nursing homes. 80% were senior citizens, yep. right? And of the 20% that weren't, I think 80% of those had some pre-existing condition. So you knew who was really at you know risk. So let's say you're out there making money and you've got your 84-year-old um, grandma at home who's at risk. You go sleep at the church. Yep. Go to work, sleep at the church, leave grandma at home. I have a friend who, yeah, I have a friend whose son works at a Walmart and uh, their grandmother lives with them. And he said, you know what, guys, just the nature of what I do, I'm going to live in the garage for the next three months. I think yes. it's the right thing to do. I'm going to miss you guys and stuff like that. 
we'll get together in the backyard, but exactly. And it's, it's a critical thing that you talk about having a place for people who, because you know, the elderly are the most worried, but the people who are worried that they're going to affect an elderly family member are number two because Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And that's a critical element of it. I appreciate that. And that's something that I, you know, nobody else has talked about, Larry, and I. Yeah. I, I look forward to you being a. Uh, I'm still being... not done, dude. I got more. Let's hear it. Next, we have to immediately say if you if you use a 3D printer, that my DA is not going to come after you. You can use a 3D printer to create a respirator or to create a test. If you want to create tests, go ahead. Again, I give you the guidelines that are there, not just from the government, but also from any other institution that wants to provide guidelines, and we tried them. Some of the tests failed. Some of the respirators weren't any good. Some weren't. But guess what? We would find that out four or five months ago, not now. We would have figured this out earlier. And we'd have respirators and we have and we'd have testing earlier, right away. All of these were stopped by government. I would have encouraged all of them to start that rock and rolling. I'm still not done. Now I end the silly licensing issues you have in New York State for medical personnel. In New York State, if you're not licensed in New York State, you can't work in New York State as a medical uh, professional. New York City is the biggest city on the planet. I'm sorry, biggest city in our country, not on the planet. In, in our country, and we have a, a density of about 25,000 people per square mile. Oh, my God. Why aren't we having people rushing to, to, to service people here? I would have allowed that also. Immediately, I would have basically said, local people, get up. Here's what I have. Let's get going. Let's do stuff. And here's the biggest piece. Now I tell... Every business, hey businesses, here are the guidelines that all the experts say we need to use. Here they are. Here are government guidelines. Here they are also. But I don't bring in my, my enforcers to start shutting people down or cops. Instead, I go to every business. If it follows government guidelines, I give them a stamp, government guideline. If you don't, you don't get it. But I also encourage the private market, AMA, whoever, to give stamps. And so now what happens? The consumers decide whether they want to go into that store or facility or not. And if they don't go in, then I guess that store closes. Government doesn't have to close. Consumers can decide and they will adjust and shift so that we can be prepared, Dan, for the next one. Another one is going to come and yeah. we don't have protocols. What? Sweden has done this and it worked. And to bring this full cycle, it's essentially what you're saying is that you want to make it legal for everybody to do whatever is their hustle to try to make money because doing your hustle is the thing that's going to get us out of this. Everybody but I want to encourage your hustle to help. Exactly. Everybody find, trying to find a way to offer a service that is yeah. valuable and that has it. And so that brings us back around to Eric Garner. Yep. Who's a guy who's actually, he's trying to do his hustle. Okay. He's trying to provide a service and that's not something that's allowed to him. Mm. And chances are pretty good right? If it had been a different guy, if it had been somebody selling loose cigarettes, right, down in the village, the police aren't going to get up behind him and choke him out. Correct. Right? And if it's uh, somebody doing it in a different situation, we're going to have a different response. And so this explosion of anger over this thing of if you're black, right, if you're a person of color, you don't get the same opportunity. You don't get the same breaks. You don't get the chance at liberty to advance something that you have this police that you as you pointed out they've been conditioned mm -hmm. think these guys have money this is where i'm supposed to go but you're also conditioned to say you know what these people don't get the same privileges yep because of the law enforcement system that we have this rule the system of laws that really we're supposed to enforce on another community and so now we have this explosion right we have all the people and this here's the thing about it too right here's the worst thing about it is for all, at least to me, all the people who are realizing, oh my God, the system is inequitable. When it's been like that, right? Yes. Cap was kneeling when, uh, you know, Eric Garner was six years ago. We're actually coming up on the six year anniversary of his death. Uh, right. Um, the woman who was just shot in Louisville. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Brianna. Yeah. Uh, you know, all, all these things have been happening. And now we're finally reaching this breaking point. What do we, how do we, how do we lead ourselves out of this spot? Where yep. we say, okay, we've had this thing and we now realize how everything that we've been doing has been suppressing people who really could be being phenomenally productive in our society. But instead we have been holding them back for whatever reason. 
How do we fix that? How does law enforcement get out of the way to fix that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people talk about justice and I've been very controversial last week and I talked about it. I'm not as concerned about justice. I know it may sound crazy, but okay, so we get the guy who 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 killed George and whatever, we kill him or whatever we do. We tar and feather him or whatever is the bad thing we do. Doesn't change the system. There's gonna right. be another George Floyd in another month or a week or a year or whatever, doesn't change. The system has to change. And there's a four point way we change it. And it's called quick, by the way. I made this up last weekend. It's a very bad acronym, but it's working, right. so fine. Uh, it's Q-I-C-C. Q, we end the qualified immunity, which either we do it, I thought, through the, the courts, because the courts don't want to take this. If they take it, they'll finally realize that it is absolutely um, unconstitutional. But then Justin Amash said, let's do it through Congress. I'm fine either way. Let's just end qualified immunity and make cops what they are. Regular people, just like us. They're people trying to do the right thing trying to do the right stuff, that's the answer, number one, Q. I, we have to, without without a doubt, get cops to carry their own insurance. They have to carry their own liability insurance like any other professional, doctors, lawyers, they all do the same thing, and you should. Why do you want cops to cover, have their own insurance? Several reasons. Number one, if they're bad at what they do, they get sued. We don't pay. The insurance company does. Their rates go up. If they become uninsurable, guess what? They can't get a job. So we don't have to fire them. The insurance company does it for them. Cops don't have to break their blue wall of silence, which we're not going to get them to break for decades because it's it's ingrained them. So don't try to break it. Instead, let the insurance company break it for us. Then boom, they go away. No worries. But I'm still not done. Not just that. Well, unions will stop it, Larry. No, no, no. Unions will love it. Here's why. You make them brokers. The unions broker the insurance, which means now they're making money from people who will pay an insurance. What does that mean? Now unions can do what they should be doing, which is supporting good cops instead of trying to defend bad cops. The bad cops will go away, and all of a sudden, the good cops will be supported by the union, as they should. That's a great idea. There's another issue. Right now, the government, when a cop does something bad, has to pay tens, if not a $100 million. In New York State, it's hundreds of millions of dollars in New York State. Right. So instead, the, it's in the government's best interest to either cover it up or not find anybody guilty. But if all of a sudden the government's not paying, the government has an incentive to actually find the truth. Not a bad idea. Right. I, what else I, happens? The I government, what, what, what happens usually is the police will get will resign. They won't get fired. They resign. So they go to. So a bad cop goes to some other town, gets a job and is still a bad cop. Now making all the good cops still look bad wherever he or she goes. Liability insurance for an individual cop is a good idea. Yeah. Next, take cannabis. Next C, take cannabis off schedule one. You take cannabis off schedule one immediately. There's no need to start uh, arresting people for, for cheesy crimes. It allows yeah. people to be released uh, from prison for cheesy crimes and cops stop arresting people for cheesy crimes, meaning they're stopping arresting a lot of poor brown and black people. And the third C is you have to uh, end civil asset forfeiture. And the way you can do the civil asset forfeiture is either through Congress or very simple as an executive order, limiting the amount of money anyone can get from it, say a hundred bucks a year, that's it. Once you do that, two things happen. You stop incentivizing people to stop people and frisk them anyway, and you defund the war on drugs. Win, 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 quick, Q-I-C-C. Q-I-C-C, quick, it's a great solution. Larry Sharp, people are gonna be able to see you in 30 minutes on your own show. Where do they go go to see that? You can head on over to The Sharp Way or Larry Sharp Libertarian. Head on over there, and I'll be talking to the good Dr. Mark Goulston, who is a brilliant doctor when it comes to empathetic communication, and he wrote a book called Just Listen. He actually used to be a uh, hostage negotiator for the LAPD. Wow. All right. So that that's where I'm going right after I finish up my next interview. But first, let me thank you, Larry, so much for being here. Thanks for dropping some knowledge on us, and uh, keep it up, man. You're making a big difference. How's it going? Thanks, Larry. So this is LPTV, uh, Libertarian Party Television. We talk about issues of the Libertarian Party. We talk about government overreach. You just heard Larry Sharp talking about uh, some of the issues that are facing government overreach in our criminal justice system right now and some potential solutions. But of course, that's one of the big stories that's going on right now. The other huge story that's going on right now is uh, is the pandemic. The pandemic transitioning to becoming endemic, we don't know yet. But we have on a guest who I've admired for a long time. I first got to see her speak in person a few years ago, uh, and 
she dropped a bomb that said, uh, if most Americans were getting more vitamin D, we would be dropping healthcare costs. And I'm like, how have I never heard this before? And the reason why is because I'd been in the system. I'd been hearing most of the normal medical advice that comes out. But a person who has been bringing truth for a long time, and I'm very happy to have on my show, Dr. Mary Ruard. Uh, Dr. Ruard, thank you so much for being on LPTV. I'm happy to do so. Thanks. So, you know, I, I want to start off with the very first thing, you know, obviously and you're a researcher, but you have behind your title ethicist as well. And I think that's a really important thing for people to talk about in this era, especially for libertarians. Can you expound on why you have that in your title? Sure. Well, I had some ethicist training and when I was in North Carolina, I actually developed a medical ethics course for practitioners of all kinds. And what I realized when I did that is the true ethicists are the libertarians. You know, we used to talk about morality, but really what we are talking about in today's terminology are ethics. And I think we should bill ourselves as ethicists because we ask the tough questions. We ask, is regulation ethical? We ask, is taxation ethical? And these are things that most ethicists don't deal with. They assume that the taxation is ethical. They assume that regulation is ethical. And hopefully, as we talk a little more, we'll see that regulation actually kills. And it's taken, at least the FDA regulations, have taken five to 10 years off each of our lives. The good news is that includes the regulators themselves, as well as Congress and the president. So if we can get this message out, maybe we can change things and look longer and healthier. That, and that's a great idea. So one of the things actually I want to talk about uh, is, uh, and I'm jumping, I'm going to jump around here a little bit. Out. I was going to go a little chronological, but one of the things that I have uh, really been alarmed by is the practice of evergreening, which I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with that term. We use it a lot in Boston. I have friends who are in big pharma, which is that because a patent lasts for 14 years, but that a pharmaceutical company can extend the patent if they introduce an innovation in the last year, then yes. they are incentivized. I wonder if you could talk a little bit how about how that is actually causing what I would consider to be unethical behavior and delaying meds from coming to market. Improve that. Well, to really understand why that's happening, we have to go back to 1962 uh, when these amendments to the Food and Drug Act were passed and the FDA got its, quote, teeth. It took, it took just about uh, 15 years or so for the time that it takes a drug to get from the lab bench to the marketplace, which used to be four years and probably would be quite lower than that now. It's now close to 14 years. And the reason I point this out is because if you are tripling more or less the development time of a drug, you are more than tripling costs because, because of the patent situation that you just mentioned, uh, companies have a very narrow window in which to recover their costs. And only two to three drugs out of 10, we're talking new drugs now, recover their costs today. So, so giving back, please so go giving ahead. back to the point you are making, um, what drug companies are doing now is they're tweaking all the little facets of the patent system they can, because if they don't, they are totally depending on blockbuster drugs to make back the development costs of most of their new drugs. Now, when I started in the industry in the 70s, we still developed drugs without patents. Today, it is impossible to do that. There's no possible way that you can recover your costs. And so it is the FDA regulations that have made patents basically necessary for the industry to survive. Of course, if you if you didn't have patents, the industry would collapse and maybe we'd realize how destructive these regulations are that keep people from having access to drugs that might save their lives for over a decade. I mean, the AIDS patients, as you could probably tell if you watch the Dallas Friars Club, they went overseas to get drugs that didn't take as long to get to the marketplace. And we have, they, they went and hired black market chemists to make the very drugs we were working on in industry 
And so by the time the FDA finally gave us permission to test them in people, every eighth patient in the country who wanted them had already had them and were resistant. So we had to wait for new people to be diagnosed. And today we have ALS patients making drugs in their kitchen because wow. of this, you know, this delay in getting drugs to market. And it's a fascinating thing. You know, it's, it's uh, the one thing I will say is that I, I this is going to be the only time I ever say something good about the president, but signing the right to try was an important legislation. But let, let's go back to, you talked about the change in the law in 1962. Mm -hmm. The government took advantage of, uh, almost a, a perceived crisis that wasn't really a crisis in the United States, right? That's correct. The thalidomide tragedy, which was happening in Europe. Here, the FDA had enough power to stop it, although it stopped it for different reasons than the side effect they were seeing in Europe. They stopped it because they uh, were concerned about some nerve damage, which is also a side effect of thalidomide, which is the drug that we're talking about. Thalidomide was a safer sleeping drug at least for adults. Unfortunately, what ended up happening is when women took it in during their pregnancy, they found out that it you know, kept the morning sickness down. It alleviated it. So eventually the company started marketing it for morning sickness. And back then we really didn't appreciate how sensitive the fetus was to drugs that are safe for adults. So <laughs> they took the drug and they had um, they had, uh, and sometimes they didn't even know they were pregnant because this happens in the early stage of pregnancy. The, the babies were born either minus a limb or sometimes they didn't even survive. Mm. And just to, to follow up on that, thalidomide mm -hmm. actually is now making a comeback as a sleeping drug, right? And well, so- As a cancer, anti-cancer drug actually. Oh, really? Yes, so yes. And it, it's been used for leprosy as well. You know, the, the age old scourge, thalidomide wow. To that yes, so thalidomide is being resurrected, um, and of course it still has these side effects or or analogs. We're trying to make analogs, of course, that don't have these side effects. But so far, as far as I know, they haven't been successful. So then, using the power of the thalidomide scare, which you know certainly, when people became aware of what was happening, I think England and Sweden were hit the worst. Uh, it was it was certainly seen as a potential tragedy. And the FDA then used that at, to get what sort of powers? How did they change what they could do after that? Well, the biggest thing uh, in some ways was the fact that now an individual at the FDA had to sign off on the drug. So all drugs have side effects. And so when side effects became common knowledge about a particular drug, that person was called on the carpet to Congress. And that was, of course, putting their head in the proverbial noose. And this is why they extended the timeline from four to 14 years, because they tried to think up everything they could. So if they were brought into Congress and, and given a hard time, they could say, well, I did my due diligence. I asked for all these other studies. The other thing it did is it demanded that the FDA establish criteria for testing effectiveness of drugs. Now the marketplace had already pretty much taken care of that. Only maybe at most 10% of the drugs that were marketed before then really had, um, had no effectiveness for the things they were marketed for. And of course, there's always a placebo effect. So even a drug that is technically not effective is going to still heal some people. So no drug is truly ineffective. But um, these effectiveness studies take a long, long time. You know, when I was at the Upjohn company, I actually got a call from the FDA. They said, Dr. Ruart, we know you just filed a patent for prostaglandins and liver disease, and we at the FDA are here to help you get it to market because it's so important. You know, 100,000 people die every year uh, of liver disease. There's no cure. And of course, I was young and naive at the time. I thought that meant something. But of course, the FDA had all these hoops we had to jump through. And when you, when you actually have a treatment for a disease that's never happened before, you don't know how much drug you have to give. You don't know how many times a day you have to give it. You don't know how long you have to treat. And you know, liver disease, for example, takes years to develop. It might have taken years to, to heal. And so if you don't know those things, when you set up your human study and you 
you don't guess right the first time, you might not get the statistical significance that the FDA requires. And if you don't, you have to repeat the studies. And we quickly calculated that if we didn't get it right the first time, our drug would be off patent by the time it was approved by the FDA. And we couldn't recover our development costs, so we never did it. So you mentioned a thing that I think a lot of people aren't aware of, that it didn't used to always be that you had to have a patent before you went to market with the drug. That's right. That's right. When it was less expensive to get FDA approval, there were drugs you could develop without patents, and companies did so. And also, to be clear, the patent system that is really restricting a lot of development of pharmaceuticals here in the United States isn't honored everywhere in the world, is it? No, no. And I'll tell you, as someone who holds five patents, yep. <laughs> it's a little bit of game playing at times. You know, sometimes it's very straightforward, but usually, you know, think about the patent examiners. You know, they get all these patent applications and there's all these older patents and what they have to do is figure out is this really novel or not and you know that's somewhat of a subjective judgment call so you know a lot of libertarians are very excited about patents as property rights but the reality is it's actually pretty tough to do it consistently because where do you draw the line where does one invention end and the other start it's it's not actually very easy to do in real life right i always say uh you know if there had been a patent on calculus, would it have gone to Leibniz or would it have gone to, to Newton, right? We have all these examples of simultaneous invention or people working on the same drug. And in the end, uh, it's, it's government intervention that ends up hurting people because uh, all these drugs that are either, you know, for sale overseas at a much cheaper price or the patent is extended, we're not able to get them. And in many ways, the FDA is, is almost a tool of the big pharmaceutical companies at this point. Especially now, because remember I told you it took 14 years, it was taking 14 years to get a drug to market. So Congress passed a law saying that pharmaceutical companies could now pay user fees for the review that the FDA gave them. Well, these started at $100,000. They're now up to several million. And so the, something like 50 to 70% of the FDA's budget, the part of the FDA that deals in approving drugs is paid for by the pharmaceutical industry. And so when Vioxx came up to be approved and some of the FDA examiners said, hey, this is a dangerous drug. Uh, the person I'm thinking of in particular was told by his supervisor that the pharmaceutical companies are our client, not the American people not Congress. The drug was approved. It was the worst drug disaster that we've had um, in the United States. And it was approved after the amendments. And I just like to point out that all of this extra testing didn't make drugs any safer. Before the amendments, the FDA withdrew about two and a half percent of the drugs for safety reasons. After the amendments, it was 3.3. Now, that might not be a big difference, but it's in the wrong direction. It's in the wrong direction. There was no improvement. So all this is totally wasted. Well, and especially if you consider that, you know, we're in the, the communication, the technology era where we should be improving, you know, using technology to actually be doing innovating faster and all that stuff. And instead, we've gone away from that. You know, mm -hmm. innovation has been slashed at least 50% according to studies of the pharmaceutical industry. I actually think it's closer to 80% because so many drugs are abandoned, like the liver disease, the prostaglandin for liver disease drug, early before development even starts. And if you, if you try to calculate how much, how many lives were lost because of drugs that never made it to market, assuming 50%, not 80%, and assuming they were only 25% as effective as the drugs currently on the market. We have a number for that, so we can calculate it. 27 million Americans have died for the loss of innovation. 15 million have died waiting for this 14 year development time. That's why we've all lost five, at least five years of our lives to these amendments. And it's fascinating, too, as we bring it around to talk about something that we've known about. We've known about coronaviruses for a long time, yes. right? And yet here we are now faced with the worst one. And 
although you know COVID certainly is more, uh, it has a, a much more deadly transmission rate uh, than coronaviruses that we've seen. It fundamentally is related in terms of structure to the other coronaviruses, but because it would have taken 14 years to bring to market a drug that we knew would eventually, you know, switch from minor pandemic to endemic, which uh, is in the system, what pharmaceutical company would want to to cure SARS? Would want to cure MERS? No, no. And and the thing is, even if you speed up the process, you make exceptions. You know, still. It's it's a tough thing to find the right drug, and in this in this pandemic, the FDA actually made us so much less safe. What they did is in early February, they said that nobody could import test kits. Right. No domestic manufacturer could make them. So you know what Larry Sharp was talking about was great, but as governor of New York, he would not have been able to make that happen because this is national. So the only test kits we had in this country, other than the CDC's one that the FDA said was the only place that could make the test and process the test, um, you know, were people who, the hospitals who had imported them ahead of the ban <laughs> or bought them ahead of the ban. And, what what ended up happening is for six weeks, we had virtually no tests because the CDCs didn't work. Right. So, you know, the FDA is supposed to make sure all this stuff is safe and effective, including diagnostic tests. And the only one they blessed was a very faulty one. So, you know, but that's what happens. You know, the FDA always, um, and this has happened in the past too, defers to or encourages another government agency uh, and gives them, you know, a free pass, so to speak, uh, that they don't give the private sector. And there the private sector was all geared up to give us these tests. And they made similar problems with protective gear. Again, um, Larry, you know, of course, very naturally, as governor would have wanted to encourage domestic manufacture of protective gear, but couldn't do it because the FDA said no. Uh, and then hand sanitizers, same deal. The whiskey distillers said they'd make hand sanitizers for us, but they'd use ethanol instead of isopropanol. Yep. And the FDA said, no, wait, wait, can't do that unless you put a poison in your hand sanitizer because otherwise people might drink it. <laughs> it's ethanol. Yep, <laughs> it's great alcohol, you know? So, um, and of course, if they did that, they would contaminate their machinery. They might not be able to clean it. In fact, most of them said they wouldn't be able to. And so, you know, they couldn't use it again when they went back to whiskey distilling. Yeah, so, it's no test Right, it Go was ahead. ATF uh, who had said that they had to put uh, denature, denature to put poison into the alcohol. And uh, my favorite libertarian joke was that, uh, Alcohol, tobacco, and firearms shouldn't be a department of the government. It should be a party. Um, we, uh, you know, it's funny because the FDA, uh, and, and I just want a quick station identification. This is LPTV. And we actually put up a site early on called FDAgoaway.com. Uh, it's rolling across the bottom of the screen right now, where we started talking about the harm that the FDA had done. And in early March, uh, we had... Uh, Dr. Peter Everett, who's an oncologist uh, in Boston on, and he said that he believed that in the last two weeks, the FDA had undone any good that they might possibly have done through uh, their prevention of testing, but also the control. You talk about the PPE. There was a plant in Indianapolis that uh, said they could produce 100,000 masks a week, but the FDA had only licensed them for 10,000. And when they <laughs> asked for permission to make more, the FDA said no. We don't know that you can do that. Um, and it is really fascinating how the FDA has almost, has, you know, we talked about this, they are the barrier to entry now, uh, you know, for so many drugs coming to market. And, you know, the exponential factor too, that I think people don't realize is how much uh, medical, and especially pharmaceutical research grows based on last year's research and the research before that. So when fewer drugs are coming to market, it actually has this giant cascade effect, right? right. I mean, you talk about how sort of one, how the industry informs itself. Mm -hmm.
That's right. And in some cases like stem cells, which the FDA have, has turned into drugs. So, so much of its research has moved offshore. Now, if you're a wealthy person, you can go offshore and get the latest stem cell treatments. But if you're not, you're going to have to wait for the FDA to approve stem cells as a drug, which really has so many issues uh, that it's crazy. Uh, I, I can't imagine that they really think that's going to work. Now, one of the things that people talk about, they say, you know, without an FDA, it's going to be like the Wild West where you had somebody traveling around selling uh, Dr. Feelgood potion or snake oil or whatever it was. Now, I am not an expert in the field, but you are. I do not know of any mass produced snake oil, something that was sold that had effect that uh, was outside of uh, that was that was a fake thing. I the market always took care of it right away. Do you know of anything well, like that? Yeah, well, actually, snake oil is very beneficial. You know, it has the oh. omega fatty acids. Yes. And so if you weren't taking your cod liver oil, fish oil could have been, uh, you know, fish oil, which would be basically snake oil um, of the day, uh, you know, might have been very beneficial for you. So, you know, it's kind of interesting that people use snake oil. And of course, there before the FDA got its teeth in 1962, there were a lot of what we call certifiers. The American Medical Association, for example, tested drugs themselves and made recommendations uh, based on what their testing was. And even today, there are journals that specialize in reviewing the literature on various drugs and reviewing the studies and making their own recommendation. And in fact, even consumers organizations do very well. The Abigail Alliance, for example, had recommended the approval of 40 different cancer drugs. Um, what they did is they told the FDA, hey, these things work, approve them now. And the FDA took on average another uh, two years for each of these drugs on average to actually approve them. Now. If a consumer's group can tell if a cancer drug is working, I mean, the record is perfect. So why did the FDA drag their feet? And on the flip side of that, public citizen, uh, uh, who does a lot of stuff I don't like, but in this case, what they did is they looked at the bad drugs and, and predicted which drugs would be taken off the market. They were right 50% of the time. And the other drugs that weren't taken off the market in general were getting black box warnings or other types of things that indicated that they had problems. So again, if consumers groups can do this well, what would medical professionals who wanted to certify drugs do? And, and you know, we have, of course, that for, um, you know, we have that for our electrical clients. It's the UL logo, you know, UL logo comes from a private certifier. So this is, <laughs> you know, this is not rocket science, so to speak. And it, it's essentially, it, it's, it's really sort of make-believe, too, the idea that the FDA is controlling that these drugs can only be used for these purposes because off-label prescriptioning happens all the time. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yes. When the FDA approves a drug, it doesn't approve it for every use. It approves it for usually one single use or maybe a couple of them. And then what happens is physicians are legally allowed to prescribe it for something other than that approved use. This is called off-label prescribing. And somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% of all prescriptions are off-label. In the cancer arena, it's closer to 90%. So you know, off-label prescribing is, is very common. And when people propose destroying off-label prescribing and making the FDA approve every indication, uh, you know, it's just really impossible because <laughs> they'd have to double or triple the FDA in order to even make that possible. And most companies don't want to go after that second indication because they don't have to start all over again, but there's a lot of paperwork and time and money involved in getting that second indication. By then, you know, their drug's probably off patent, so they don't bother. And so, I mean, I guess the most famous example of that is that Viagra did not start off as a treatment for ED, right? It started off as, uh, was it a heart medication, blood pressure? Yes, actually, the Upjohn Company um, actually was getting into this. Viagra didn't come from the Upjohn Company, but they actually started this whole ball rolling. What happened is we found out that all of a sudden, the prescriptions for um, one of our prostaglandins was skyrocketing. 
And this was a drug that was used in blue babies to keep their ductus open until they were ready for surgery, right? So someone did some investigation and found out that men were injecting it into their private parts in order to get an erection. And so, you know, Upjohn right. didn't want to get into that too much, but they finally did get the ball rolling. And eventually um, another company put out Viagra, which, you know, was a more stable product and, and didn't have to be injected. It could be taken orally. So, of course, that's how that all happened. And so, you know, the idea that the FDA is somehow controlling the research and, and what what's happening with the way people are using drugs is completely fictitious. And in fact, what we found is that people are a much better evaluator of what really works in the pharmaceutical market. Well, yeah, and today people, patients talk to each other, you know, over the internet, Facebook, you know, groups of, you know, people have Parkinson's, have their special sites where they talk to each other. And you can pretty quickly find out what works and what doesn't work. So as far as effectiveness, you know, I think, I think we wouldn't have to worry too much. I think the market would pretty much decide once again. Right. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, you know, you, you mentioned Parkinson's. I know there are lupus groups out there, Lyme yes. disease groups, all these people who, you know, are searching for things. And in many ways, it's the FDA that is restricting their health so much. So briefly, before we wrap, I wonder if you could talk about uh, what uh, the one thing that I'd heard you talk about beforehand, too, is how basic nutrition information is being somewhat suppressed by the pharmaceutical companies and the government doesn't give us any good advice about, about basic nutrition. Well, the FDA is actually suppressing it, um, whether you want to say it's on behalf of the pharmaceutical companies or not. In the early 80s, we knew that the B vitamin folic acid um, would prevent neural tube defects, which is the type of birth defect that we can test for in utero. Now, if these children are born, they generally have to be institutionalized. It's a very serious problem. And the FDA told the folic acid manufacturers that if they told their customers about this, you know, that they would be prosecuted because they didn't go through the 14 years of hoop jumping. Right. Yeah. So then when the Center for Disease Control started telling young women, hey, you need to take folic acid and you need to take it now, not when you get pregnant, because it works in the first month or two. Uh, the FDA said to the folic acid manufacturers, we will prosecute you if you even mention the CDC's recommendation. Well, other countries were advertising this. So in other countries, the neural tube defects were going down. Here, the FDA did a complete reverse a few years later and said, okay, all the grain manufacturers of cereals and breads have to fortify with folic acid. So of course, women didn't get the right amount and it didn't help. So this is how, this is how the FDA is, is destroying prevention. And there's so many things we could talk about in this prevention. And that's why I say five to 10 years of our lives have been taken off yeah. because I believe that prevention is so important uh, that that adds another five years. Of course, I can't do the calculation there because, you know, I have to just go on what I've seen so far. But, you know, there are researchers out there have said that if everyone doubled their vitamin D levels, we'd live two years longer. So, you know, you can kind of get a feel if that's what could happen for just one nutrient. Right. Yeah. And that, that is amazing. Dr. Ruart, I think that there are a lot of people who are, in fact, I'm looking right now, uh, Christopher Baca from New Mexico just became a monthly pledger uh, because of this great show that's going on. People who want to know more about you, is there a website that they can go to? They can go to my website, ruart.com, and if they go to the lower right-hand corner, they can get a link to all of my social media. And, and so I, I actually am a, am a proud owner of uh, Death by Regulation, and I have been waiting uh, for a year to get my copy autographed. Are you going to the convention in Orlando? I haven't quite decided yet. You know, I am 70, so I am in the <laughs> I, I group of... Uh, I, I, I'm in the same boat. I'm a person. I have bronchial ecstasy, and I, I'm not convinced whether or not I want to go. At some point in time, I, I'm going to get my copy autographed, and I would advise other people to go out and buy it right now and get that done. Dr. Ruart, thank you so much for this show and for the information that you are sharing out there, because the libertarian voice in this area is the only one that is countering the misinformation that government is putting out there right now. And it's crazy because people want to believe that their government is at least not giving them misinformation, 
But I think what COVID has shown is that we are being, we are not even getting good information. We are getting information that is bad for us, that threatens our health, threatens our livelihoods. And most of all, it stops any innovation that's happening in the field right now. So thank you again for this wonderful show. I'm going to briefly point out on my lapel, I am wearing a lifetime Libertarian Party. Dr. Ruud, I believe you are also a lifetime member of the Libertarian right. Party. Anybody, and that's we, we appreciate that so much. Uh, people who want to find out more, lp.org slash lifetime. This is LPTV. Thank you all very much for tuning in this evening.